results, U.S. land versus Canada, Permian Basin versus Mid-Continent, and so forth. Now, one of the first things that we like to track is activity and trends. And so most of the operators were telling us that as they kind of look ahead into 2020 in North America land, about 52% of the operators were planning to keep their expenditures for artificial lift pretty flat with what they had done the year before. What's interesting to note is only about 9% of the operators were actually planning to spend less money on uh, artificial lift. Now this is interesting in the sense that when you drill a well and you complete a well, there's been a tremendous amount of drilling and completion efficiencies that have been realized in the market. Uh, for example, uh, I'll, I'll slide over here real quick just to, to show you this graph here, if I have one here. Yep, I do, perfect. Let me make it larger. So you can see in 2019 versus 18, the oil and gas operators were able to complete hydraulically fracture their wells in 23.9% fewer days and drill their wells in 5.3% fewer days. So what does that mean? I was talking to an operator yesterday and he was telling me that we're going to drill more wells this year and complete more wells this year, but we're going to end up spending less money than last year, right? because they're doing them quicker, there's been a lot of pricing concessions, and so everyone's able to accomplish more with less. When it comes to artificial lift, it's a little bit different story because when you take a look at what's happening in the United States land market on this slide, if you look at the installed base of the wells of the operators that we've interviewed, you know, back in the dark days when I started this industry in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, this chart right here to the left would have said 80% rock lift. <laughs> would have been what's going on out there. But on an installed based basis of the operators that we were interviewing, only about 50% of their wells were on rod lift and the other 50% were on other forms of lift. And it becomes even more drastic when you start to take a look at the first stage of uh, the, the initial installation of artificial lift. So in the United States land, when you drill an unconventional well and it flows freely for a period of time, when you go to put it on its first form of artificial lift, you can see right here, rod lift is almost non-existent. You can imagine the phone calls we were getting at Kimberlite Research in 2015 and 16 and all the market studies we had to do from the likes of Lufkin and the rod lift providers that were going, um, all right, the market downturn hit. We have no orders for rod lift. And then as the rig count started to climb back up from 400 to 500 to 600 to 700, they still weren't getting any rod lift orders. And they kept telling us and said, what in the heavens is going on? Well, the operators start out principally with gas lift or ESP as their first form of artificial lift. And it started out in 2015 that they would put it on gas lift as a trial basis just to see if they could get 12 months on the thing. Then they started to go to 24 months. Today, they're trying to keep it on gas lift three, four, five years, and some operators will tell us, if I could keep it on gas lift for the life of the well, I would, but I know I can't. Eventually, they're gonna die on a run. Um, you're probably not familiar with the term net promoter score, but what this graph is depicting is the satisfaction levels, if you will, that the EMP operators have with their suppliers of these various lift type systems. And probably has a uh, laser on it, doesn't it? Or does it not? Yep. Here's a laser. So you can see electric submersible pumps have the lowest customer loyalty ratings by the EMP operators. Put another way, the EMP operators are the least happy with their ESP providers. And they're the least happy with the ESP providers, not so much about the providers, it's about the ESP itself, right? The ESPs will fail within days, weeks, or months. And if you're able to get a good six or nine month run on an ESP, you just, you know, you count your lucky stars. Because in today's wells, with all the, the all the slugging, the gas slugging that's coming back at you, if you drill the toe up, toe down, you've got all the sand and the debris, you're, fra you're hydraulically fracturing these wells with 20, 30 mi million pounds of sand. You've got 20, 20, 30 million gallons of water going in there and it's not Aquafina that's going in that hole. So you're creating all types of downhole nasty stuff going on right now. And you can see that the customer loyalty ratings of for gas lift systems 
how it, see how it gyrated here from 16 to 17 to 18 to 19? There was some, um, there was a lot of people trying gas lift for the very first time. And so they were struggling with how to get it to work properly, quite frankly. Had you asked the U.S. land operator back in 2010, 11, 12, 13, or 14, why don't you use gas lift on the United States uh, land mill? They would have looked at you funny and said, son, what are you talking about? Today, if you ask someone, why don't they use a gas lift, they think they're crazy not to. All the operators want to use gas lift uh, a lot, and plunger lift as well. They use the ESPs principally to maximize uh, initial production rates. When we run the statistical correlations based on the gift of feedback from your peers and operators in the industry, the top three factors that have the highest statistical correlation to who they recommend as a, a supplier to use is which supplier is giving me the best overall performance, reliable equipment, and being most responsive to my needs. Because when I was at Chevron, you know, if we drove one well or two wells or three wells or four wells a year, that was a pretty big deal back then. Today, you know, you're drilling wells, you know, one every couple of weeks, you're drilling dozens if not hundreds of wells, and the cadence and the speed at which you're moving is such that you really need to be able to audibleize quickly and have really nimble suppliers that can adapt to what you need to do. If you go with the rod lift systems, this graph is really interesting because for rod lift systems, the, the thing that captures my eye is 33% of the rod lift users that we interviewed said that their rod lift system is going to fail within a year. Put another way, if you're Oxy and you've got thousands of wells in the Permian Basin, right, that's on rod lift, and a third of them are going to fail every year, you can just do the math of how many rod lift systems are going down each week, right? Um, and it really puts you on a maintenance treadmill. If you ask the operators why did their rod lift system break, and this is an open-ended question so they can respond whatever they would like, we have to read through all these verbatim comments, but when you read through the verbatim comments, you'll find that they're citing very, uh, you know, several different reasons. That's why this doesn't add to 100%, but, you know, some of these are interrelated. Uh, they commonly talk about the rod failing or parting or holes in tubing or pump failure. And then when you ask them, well, what do you attribute to be the root cause for that? Then you get a whole litany of reasons from the operators. But if you look at this categorically, um, if you add up like corrosion and scale and paraffin and all this stuff, you'll find that um, the ineffectiveness of the production chemical programs tend to account for 40 to 50% of all rod lift failures, right? And then you've got deviated well bores like, um, you know, there was an operator in the Eagleford that told me that they would, we drilled such crooked wells that whenever we do get them off gas lift, I don't think they'll ever be able to operate on a rod lift system. We, we prematurely deviated the wells. And, I, you know, Will Tank up here with Oxy, I spent a lot of time with one of his colleagues, Jonathan, and, you know, there was a day and a time, even at Oxy, where the well planners thought, like you know, George Bush Intercontinental Airport, that as soon as you take off, you want to avoid well board collisions, so you just start deviating a well. And so you're sitting on a pad with five or 10 wells and you're prematurely deviating, not realizing that you're making that well unable to ever be produced with a rod lift system in year five through 20 or whatever you're gonna be there. And so a lot of the operators like Oxy are really spend a lot of time and attention to making sure that they drill straight gauge holes and as, as long straight horizontals as best as possible, as little torturosity as possible. When you look at the performance ratings of the surface unit providers on a scale of one to 10, um, you can see that there is a range of performance where some surface unit providers perform more poorly than other surface unit providers. And when you start to analyze this statistically, you start to put it onto like a value grid where you've got performance on the x-axis and you've got pricing competitiveness on the y-axis down here. So this x-axis is industry performance. The midpoint is industry average performance. Better than industry average performance to the right. Worse than industry average performance to the left on the x-axis. The midpoint of this y-axis is considered through the eyes of the operators to be pretty industry normal pricing competitiveness. Attractive pricing at the bottom, less attractive pricing at the top. As an oil company, at least when I was at Chevron, 
I always wanted to try to get an operator that was at least performing on the x-axis at industry average performance levels or even better, right? Some cases you have to pay more to get more, and some cases you find a really good value, right? But as long as you can avoid suppliers that are in this top left-hand quadrant in large measure, um, you'll be in good shape So, um, as an operator. From an oil field service company, um, your gift of feedback from the operators to the oil field service companies is immense because if I work at an oil field service company and I think I'm making improvements, but what I don't know is how are my improvements comparing to the improvements of my competitors? Are they improving faster or slower? So we're trying to benchmark all this. So if we pick up the pace here just a little bit and we go on to soccer rides, you can see that most of the operators are using conventional steel rides. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked by operators and by service companies about the adoption rate of coal, coiled and hybrid uh, ride strings. But, you know, uh, it, it's just, you know, part of the string may be fiberglass, a hybrid, and some of these steel, but the adoption rates that we're seeing in the marketplace are just not as high as a lot of people envision them to be. When you look at the performance levels of the soccer ride providers, you see the width of those bars start to widen out. So we're starting to see even wider variances from one sucker ride uh, service supplier to another sucker ride service supplier. So the other caveat that I have when I counsel and, and, and provide advice to a lot of oil companies, like this week alone, I've, I've spoken to three or four uh, with their, in many cases, it's their supply chain organizations. And I'm trying to explain to the supply chain organizations that not all service suppliers are the same. You know, if all you're going to do is go, go, go after price and availability as an operator, you're going to miss out on the fact that some suppliers perform better than other suppliers. Okay? And there's an impact on that. If you look at the competitive landscape for sucker ride suppliers, if you look at the, the, major, uh, the major suppliers, which are basically Dover, Apergy, or Norris, Apergy here in Weatherford, you can see that their pricing competitiveness is viewed very similar. It's how they're positioned on the on the pricing in the y-axis. The only difference is Norris rides is outperforming Weatherford rides. Tenaris is opening up a brand new soccer ride facility just up north in Conroe, right? And then there's a little company called TRC here. They do a lot of uh, uh, distribution of used and inspected rides, but they also have the right to sell new rides as well. And so they're much smaller. The customers that have used TRC gave them very favorable ratings as compared to the ratings that the Weatherford customers were, were, were rating Weatherford, right? So you can tell that there's a difference in competitive landscape. So if I was an operator, and if Weatherford and, and Apergy are giving me the same or similar pricing competitiveness, Statistically, based on the voice of the peers of your operators, Apergy is going to statistically end up doing a better, a better job based on the voice of the customer, voice of the operator. Again, we at Kimberlite Oil Field Research are completely independent. We have performance data on over 1,500 oil field service companies. We have over 340,000 supplier performance ratings, and we add about 100,000 ratings into our, our, our supplier ranking database each year. When you move to uh, downhole pumps, again, you see variability between the pump suppliers. When you look at the competitive landscape, and again, you look at the major market share leaders, again, you see a very, you see, uh, a very similar pricing competitiveness range here on this y-axis between the, the market share leaders of Apergy, Donan, Schlumberger, and Weatherford. And then if you're looking for some other secondary suppliers for optionality, there's a company called Endurance down here. And, and, the, and the customers that have used Endurance, when they rated Endurance, as compared to the ratings that Donan got or Weatherford's customers gave Weatherford or Apergy's customers gave Apergy, Endurance shows up. And so one of the reasons why some operators will sometimes call us up, even supply chain organizations sometimes, would be to try to expand their supplier network. See, the, the number one problem an oil company has is if all you've used is one supplier, you don't have any way to really evaluate how a, an alternative supplier will perform. You've never used them before. You don't know how they're going to perform, right? And so with, the, with your gift of feedback, 
we're able to benchmark these 1,500 suppliers used globally by product line, by region, and we can start to look at dislocations in the market and try to identify alternative suppliers that should be considered. I can't tell you how many times I've sat with operators in a room going, I've never heard of that company before, or I didn't realize that they did that, or who are they, and so forth and so forth. When you move to electric submersible pumps, um, what's interesting about the electric submersible pump business is you can see 30, 40% of the pumps are leased. Okay, and in a lot of these electric submersible pumps that go on the hull are sacrificial pumps. They're not like putting a brand new uh, uh, GMC Denali down the hull. They're putting 160,000 mile Chevy Suburban down the hull because they know this poor thing's gonna wipe out within three weeks to three months to maybe six months, right? So there's a lot of leasing that goes on with electric submersible pumps. And for many of the operators, they tell us that the use of these electric submersible pumps is a necessary evil in life because they're trying to maximize the initial production of the well for the first six, 12 months. And, and, and ESPs allow, help, help them to do that. Advancements in gas lift, though, are, are really trying to close that gap. When you look at electric submersible pumps, you can see that 41 and 6, what is that, 47% of the ESP users say that that ESP is going to fail within a year, right? Um, we have clients like Access ESP, they're an equal company, um, they have what I call the ESP docking station for uh, offshore remote areas to where when you have to change out the ESP in these remote areas, you don't have to bring a drilling rig in, you can just do it off a workover rig, right? And so you know, their little access ESP docking station cost a million dollars. But the problem is if you have an ESP in a remote area, the ESP may only cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars, but it may cost you five million dollars to install it. So uh, as it relates to the United States, um, most of the ESPs are changed out rather frequently just due to all the, all the, the problems that they have here, as you can see. Uh, they have lots of electrical issues and motor failures and pump failures, but most of the failures are attributed to sand, solid debris, corrosion, um, scale, and all types of crud down there. If you look at the ESP uh, providers' uh, so, uh, performance ratings, the biggest variance that you see is with equipment performance, responsiveness, and pricing competitiveness. When you look at the competitive landscape for ESPs, um, again, you can see that the market share leader, Baker Hughes, is positioned in a, you know, they're viewed as providing about industry average performance and close to industry average pricing. What's interesting about Baker Hughes for ESPs is they used to be in this top right-hand quadrant where they perform better than industry average, and you had to pay a premium for that. Right? So, I mean, everybody knows you're gonna end up paying more for a, whatever, Denali versus a stripped down, you know, Chevy. But Baker Hughes's performance is well within the fair value fairway, but they're just not in their historical level. Uh, Barrett's is a small little company um, from overseas, and they've been kind of growing a little bit. Apergy thought accelerated, I think ESP, and they're growing. Uh, Summit ESP was acquired by Halliburton, and, uh, and, and they perform well. But then the United States land market, Summit ESP, Halliburton, if you will, they tend to, to receive very high ratings. In the gas lift market, you can see that the mean time between failure for gas lift systems is getting closer to 31.7 months, almost three years, right? So. So think about it. I have an ESP, it can fail within days, weeks, or months. I have a gas lift system that's lasting on average close to three years. Types of failures are mostly valve issues. Uh, lots of corrosion scale and wax being attributed to the cause of the failures, coupled with sand and debris, wear and tear. This is a new trend that we see. When we first started studying gas lift systems in 2015, when we were getting calls from our oil field service company clients going, 
We're not getting any orders for rod lift systems, but we're starting to see some orders for gas lift. What's up? Because no one uses gas lift in U.S. land, right? And and I remember interviewing the operators when they were first using a gas lift systems. And they're like, well, you know, I don't know, maybe to handle 100 barrels a day, 500 barrels a day. Today, operators are getting more comfortable with gas lift systems and high flow rate gas lift systems being able to handle 1,000 or 2,000 barrels a day, right? If you think about it, offshore, that's done all the time. <laughs> I don't know why they thought it was different on land other than the fact that they didn't think the bottom hole pressures would be able to support it. The other thing we see here, as you can see, is the use of downhole pressure and temperature gauges is going up. And it used to be in the United States land market, um, U.S. land wells didn't really have any really downhole monitoring of the reservoir. They did have monitoring for ESPs and stuff. But we're seeing that for gas lift systems, um, you know, close to 50% of the installations are 50% plans to use. We got US land. We got 50% of the operators planning to use it on about 50% of their installs. So that's about 25, about one in four of all gas lift systems in the United States, based on the feedback from the operators, are, are putting in uh, pressure and temperature gauges to try to optimize a gas lift system. When you look at the, um, if you take a look at the competitive landscape for gas lift suppliers, the, the two suppliers that tend to stand out here are Floco and Superior Energy Services. And Superior Energy Services, I think, was recently purchased by Endurance, who showed up on one of those other graphs. You move in the plunger lift, which is a more uh, uh, niche area for many people to be using plunger lift. Average mean time between uh, failure performance for plunger lift is about 18 months. Uh, plunger wear and tear, the number one problem cited and, 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 pat and springs being wore out. Where, uh, basically, wear and fatigue, just normal wear and tear and fatigue are the number one uh, root causes for the failures of these plunger lift systems. There's a fair amount of variance, again, in the performance of the various plunger lift suppliers. And when you look at the competitive uh, landscape, um, I think Harvard, uh, Harvest and Fisher, that's owned by Apergy, they're really kind of the market share leader and they really kind of dominate the space as being that premium based supplier that costs more than worth it. Well, lots of these other suppliers are well within the fair value zone. Historically Superior, who I mentioned, uh, mentioned has been recently acquired, they've traditionally been in kind of the fair value zone. They only recently kind of shifted to the left. I imagine they're probably moved back to the right. In the production chemical report, again, it's a, uh, it, it's a global report. We talked to a bunch of chemists and production engineers and managers for this report. When we ask the operators, what's the number one improvement you'd like to see from your production chemical supplier, you read through the host of verbatims, this is the best effort we could come up with, so I'm gonna have to interpret this for you. I, um, what the operators are telling me, or telling us is, look, we all use production chemicals for flow assurance, right? But it's like pouring, you know, money down the hole, because it doesn't really work and oftentimes the, the level of effectiveness is not very high. And I, I think I just shared with you that a lot of the artificial lift failures are attributed to ineffective production chemical programs. And so what the operators are asking the production chemical suppliers to do is to be, uh, to be more effective in diagnosis of what's going on down home, all right? The problem with so many wells is they'll take a, a sample, they'll send it off to the lab, and four or six weeks later, you get your your analysis report back. But as I just talked about, if you've got rod lift systems and you got five going down a week or 10 going down a week, and you're trying to do root cause analysis, by the time your sample comes back four or five, six weeks later, you know, you're anywhere from five to 50 wells down the road on other failures. And so we have to be able to diagnose better in the field. We have to better be able to digitize. So. One of the, like, like this meeting I'm going to next after, after this session, you know, this particular production chemical supplier has digitized all of their oil samples, right? So 
they know that if you're in a particular you know, county in West Texas and the roof can't see and you've got a particular type of bacterial infection, bacteria in your well, all the wells in that zone in the Tri-County area are probably affected with the same bacteria. So there's, there's lots of rooms for improvement there. When you look at the distribution of, of dollars for chemicals, most of the dollars are going towards corrosion management control and scale management control. And, when, and then when you take a look at the effectiveness levels of these chemical treatments on a scale of nine to 10, with nine and 10 saying, yes, these treatments work really, really well versus ratings of six or lower indicating that these treatments don't work at all versus a, a rating of seven or eight indicating that, yeah, I think they kind of work, I'm not really sure. You've got more people saying that these treatments don't work if you took the six and lower. If you certainly took the seven, sixes, fives, fours, threes, twos, and ones, there'd be more people saying that their production chemical program doesn't work than does work, but yet, it's a, I forgot the size of the, uh, the market. It's like an $8 billion global market size, right? So there's $8 billion being spent on production chemicals where most of the users are saying it doesn't work. Go figure, right? Um, but there's certainly an opportunity to do better diagnosis. If we looked at those feedback and we filtered the data on North America land from the artificial lift report that I just shared with you. So if I just looked at the responses from the North America land oil and gas operators from the artificial lift report, and I read through all those verbatims as to what they attributed to be the root cause for their artificial lift system to break or fail, the rod lift system operators attributed 50% of the failure due to a failure of a production chemical program, either due to corrosion inhibitor, scale, wax, paraffin, H2S, or something uh, not working effectively. When you look at the performance ratings of these production chemical providers, and there's probably like 40 more, there's at least 40 different production chemical suppliers being cited as being used globally. Um, there's a lot of really small production chemical suppliers. There's a wide variance in performance levels. And then you can see that the, the smaller mid-tier independent production chemical suppliers, of which there are many, dozens, down here at the bottom right, they in aggregate are viewed as providing better overall value and service than the market share leaders, NALCO, that's going to be called Champion X, that is going to be acquired by Apergy, supposedly, in Q2 of this year, right? So think about that. Apergy, who's a you know, one of the big players in artificial lift is going to buy a fairly large player in production chemicals. Why is that? Well, I just shared with you there's a linkage between an artificial lift system to perform and the effectiveness of the production chemicals, right? I, we also talked about how oil and gas operators no longer just drill the well, put it on a rod pump, and walk away. They may start with an ESP try to move it to a gas lift system, and then eventually move it to a rod lift system. Your production chemical delivery system into that well bore is gonna be different if it's on a jet pump or an ESP or a gas lift or a rod lift system. And those have to be properly integrated. And I think, for the most part, that kind of provides kind of an overview of the artificial lift and production chemical report I don't know if there's questions or if there's other product lines that anyone here would have an interest in, but um, we cover about 100 different product lines, but today's session was on artificial lift and production chemicals, but if there's other questions that you want to ask as it relates to artificial lift, production chemicals, or any other product lines, uh, be more than glad, glad to address it. Yes? That's a great question, and uh, Mike, you're probably smiling about that because um, you know the old milk uh, milk delivery runs where they would just go and squirt a gallon into the analyst and hope that it would somehow work its way down and through the well. The capillary systems, I, I think, are going to be you know, more required.
required and we don't we haven't been tracking that but i think maybe for 2020 mike we should track what percent of their chemical delivery systems are capillary versus um you know traditional milk runs i know people use milk runs because they're cheap but they're not very effective at all at least not in today's wells because you're going down whatever five seven eight thousand feet then you're turning and going out another five or ten thousand feet the, uh, you have two problems with production chemicals today. Uh, one is what you mentioned, it's not, the chemical's not even getting down to where you need it to be. But let's just assume that you do get it down to where you need it to be. Um, in the hydraulic fracture report, you begin to realize that they're hydraulically fracturing these wells with 20, 30 million pounds of sand, and the sand's a great absorbent, right? So if the pipe doesn't absorb it and the sand doesn't absorb it, then whatever you have left will go treat the well. And so, they're having to reformulate these chemicals to where they can operate in these high profit intensity environments, right? I guess I was surprised that, uh, that uh, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, Jonathan, that is, you know, a passion of his is to try to control the dog leg severity. But uh, I don't feel like we really know for sure at least from a, a design standpoint, we don't know for sure exactly what dog legs are. Uh, the dog leg, you know, height, the you know, degrees per hundred foot. We don't, and it very, it should vary from top to bottom. I don't think we know from a design standpoint how you can predict how bad the wear is going to be. I mean, we have some, we have how some. How bad the, the what? The wear will be oh. for the rods and the tubing. And I would have, I would have imagined or guessed that wear or uh, the uh, deviated well bore would be would have been worse than the chemical so that's kind of eye-opening that the chemical is a bigger issue than, the, than right. the deviation so the comment from will and we'll was with oxy and um, you know again oxy spends a lot of attention to try to drill straight wells and, and make short radius turns and and try to drill a straight lateral if the rotary steerable will allow them to do that rather than a corkscrew right but um, the deviation of the well bores was cited as a chief cause of the rodlin system to be failing at a lower percent than chemicals because a lot of operators have wised up to the fact that you don't have to prematurely deviate the well bore um, for a well bore collision con control, right? Uh, so you may have a pad with five or 10 or 20 wells on it and you're just getting over and you're gonna drill these laterals about a thousand feet apart. But as you're going down vertically, you're gonna to have to trust your, your survey data and your directional control that you're gonna be able to go relatively straight to where you're not gonna collide with the nearby well board. And that confidence level has been increasing with a lot of the operators of recent. Uh, a lot of these prematurely deviated wells uh, quite honestly, we were drilled in 15 and 16. I think the operators began to wind up in 17, 18, and 19, and that's a no-no. Um, I think what a lot of the operators are struggling with today is the torturosity of the horizontal. And um, in, our, in our hydraulic fracture report that we published this uh, summer, the percent of wells drilled and completed in the United States land market that failed to meet performance expectations jumped up from like 12% to 20%. And in the mid-continent region of the United States, scoop stack region, it jumped up to like, I forgot, like one in three or 33% or 40% of the wells were not meeting performance expectations. So some of it is they are trying to figure out the reservoir characterization in the fabric of the rock. But a lot of it too is we're drilling very torturous well paths. We're using more brown sand and brown sand, being a geologist, brown sand's brown for a reason. It has a lot of micaceous fines in it. So even though the sand is, is being used to prop open the rock, it has enough micaceous fines that it's also plugging the rock. So we're plugging and propping at the same time. And, and the operators that I talk to are like, David, this just makes so much intellectual sense. I mean, it's common sense almost but we can't model this. In fact, all the success that we've had from the downturn of 2015, when we went from 2,000 drilling rigs down to 400 drilling rigs, and now we're producing 2 million plus barrels a day versus the downturn with less than half as many drilling rigs, was all done without modeling. In fact, only about one in three of the fractiles are even modeled. 
And so it's really the empirical uh, evidence, empirical engineering and design of trial and error that we've achieved these levels of great successes. And so to your point, Will, uh, I think what's happening based on our interviews with the operators is they've learned from the past, try not to prematurely deviate from well bore. Unfortunately, there's such a high population of wells drilled 15, 16, and even 17 vintage. I don't know how we're gonna produce them long term. And so you're seeing a lot of evidence now out, out, out there about um, oil companies coming out and saying, well, you know, these wells maybe are not gonna produce for as many years as we thought they were gonna produce. So they're not gonna produce the volumes that we thought they were gonna produce. And a, and a lot of these adjustments are due to the fact that how you drill the well and how you complete the well does make a difference in how, uh, how that well is gonna actually produce long term. And we're just now beginning to see those effects. Um, any questions in the back there from Deb, or do you have any questions? Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any others? Um, I, again, I, it, this is just a real informal roundtable discussion, and you know we're starting to do these on a monthly basis. We we, we change up the topics. Um, you know, sometimes we'll have five or six or seven or eight. I think last month we had three or four people from XTO, which was easy for them to drop down. <laughs> They're just down the street. Yes. In some studies, we will ask uh, to the operators, who do they associate as kind of being the technology leader, right? Uh, we didn't ask that um, in this particular study, but we've asked it in other studies. Um, but um, and we do, it depends on the product line that we're researching of the 100 product lines or so. Yeah. As a researcher, we'll try to make sure that's captured in the Combo verbatim. And some people say, yeah, there's a Right, in the voice of customer section, we we'll sometimes ask questions like, you know, uh, what developments have brought you success as an operator? And oftentimes you'll hear an operator talks very specifically about a particular oil field service company's technology. Like I, I, I recall one most recently was for formation evaluation and some guy in California was talking about Somerset's new sonic scanning, scanner or something like that, right? I. Um, was really helping them out. So uh, we, we captured it either directly or indirectly, but in this particular artificial lift report, we really didn't. It, it, would, it would be in the verbatims in the back of the report if we had any feedback along those lines. I, um, I mean, you're with Encana, mostly in the, in the Antarctica yeah. on the right. And um, you said, do you have any rigs you had right in six? Five. Five rigs. How many wells you guys gonna drill this year, do you think? Mm, I think somewhere around 80. 80? 80? Yeah. Wow, okay. And then when those wells come online, what form of lift do you typically put them on, place them on? Gas lift. Gas lift, okay. We pretty much gas lift for the first two to three years and plug your lift, plug your lift from there on out. From there on out, okay. You know, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. We've had we've had operators tell us that one of the reasons they go from gas lift to plunger lift is for deposit control because the production chemical program doesn't work, and so it just kind of keeps the tubing clean. It just keeps wiping it clean <laughs> and everything. And so that's another positive for a plunger lift system I found out there with some operators is they use it for flow assurance <laughs> where they can. So that's good. I am. Um, uh, any other comments? Yes, sir. Just curious, I don't know if you know this or not, but how many operators are able to repurpose their wellhead gas for those gas systems? Do you see that? Do you see any information about that in your survey or my region? Or you know, um, 
we have that data kind of indirect, indirectly, if my memory serves me correct. When we were doing those proprietary custom studies to try to dig into what's going on with this gas lift rod lift phenomenon, um, usually only about 10 or 20 percent of the operators were saying that availability of gas was a problem for them and it was really going to be a stopper for them to consider gas lift, right? The majority of the operators that we've interviewed that had the desire to use gas lift, I'd say 70 to 80 percent of the time, they had available gas. And the other thing about compression is um, the way they keep score on the operators, you guys could educate me better in this than I could, about who pays for the artificial lift system and who's paying for the compression in the field, right? And so oftentimes they sit on different sides of the cost ledger. And oftentimes there's excess compression out there in the field that there isn't that sits on different sides of the cost ledger. And so it's a lot easier to sometimes hide what the true cost is for a gas lift system. But at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the cost of the installation with the gas lift system, even if you put a pressure temperature gauge down there to monitor to optimize it, the, the economics still drive it very favorably. And, um, and 70 to 80% of the time that the operators have predominantly told us that availability of gas isn't a problem. Every now and then, 10, maybe 20% of the time, they say that gas is a limited factor. In some cases, they may actually purchase gas, believe it or not. But sometimes operators will kind of trade amongst themselves if they know each other in the, in the surrounding area and kind of cut deals to, to make gas available. Especially in the Permian. Yeah, exactly. Now, we but, don't, our um, last study, we actually had feedback pertaining to this. It was anomalous, right? It wasn't something that we asked about, but it was, um, you know, the amount of gas that's out in the Permian right now, you sell it at a loss. So you have to sell it to your neighbor or you have to flare it or pump it back down the hole. Yeah, and we are flying at record levels. Um, even for an old guy like me for 30 plus years, I kind of find that a little bit alarming. So uh, yeah, hopefully we get one more four year stint in the White House before we have to shut all that down. <laughs> so, <laughs> I am, uh, because that's a lot of flaring out there. A lot of flaring. Let's see it from space. <laughs> Infrastructure will probably determine that in the future, right? There's no piping. Not much, at least. Yeah, you know, we've done a lot of studies too. On um, are you going to go to the electric motors versus gas and things like that, and, um, or diesel? And the, the problem with electric, the electrical grids are just not very strong out there in, in the field. And so, um, as you move to electric compression, it's a little bit more difficult than to use you know, gas-fed compression where you've got generally available gas. So, ga gas really hasn't been a limiting factor for the adoption of gas, but. It's, the one thing that's interesting about the United States land market is if something works, it gets adopted quick, and the word of mouth goes, right? So, I, um, and that's what's happened with gas in large measure. Any other questions, or? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of your, your sentence. Do you guys have planning of providing like graphs of like the trends over the years of like how, because I, I see the little graph of how gas lift has performed, but I was curious yeah. as well about the supplier performance over the years. <laughs> and, and if if you've seen like a, a change in the smaller providers taking a, little, a larger share of the market. Right, now, that's, a, that's a really good question. And um, we actually do track that. Um, I, this wasn't part of the report summary today, but um, is there a particular product line you're interested in? Uh, not necessarily, but you know, sometimes it's one of the things that I think would be of value because I, I do receive these reports and to show when we're trying to make a decision of using a new vendor, it's the view of the competitor. Right? And so this is one that you're talking about, and we do track these. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good question. Like, uh, this is North American land for what I get, ESPs. And if you look at Apergy here, you see how their uh, reliability performance right here for Apergy was up here. 
and then it went down and it fell down below and then it came up, right? Well, they had an issue, right? Obviously. Um, at least the, the voice of customer data, the voice of the operator data set was an issue. And certainly, you can imagine, um, Apogee is one of our clients, clearly. Um, they didn't dispute that. But, but the fact is, you're absolutely right. Um, as an operator, if you could have your druthers, you know, if you could have your desires, you would, you would want someone that's showing stable uh, performance. Like you take Halliburton, as we, which is really some of ESP, right? John Kenner started some of the ESP. He used to be president of Centralist, right? And you look at uh, Summit, their responsiveness to needs have always been at or above industry average performance, the, the dash line. Their field service performance has always been at or better than uh, the industry average, the technical support. Their equipment performance of the ESP has been about industry average. So John Kenner's ESP, or some of the ESP, isn't gonna last from a reliability it can't take the gas slugs any better than Central F's ESP, right? But they're gonna help perform them on service. Barrett's, you see how Barrett's was down here in the cellar and they came up this way? I call that the Will Fobble effect. Will Fobble used to be the president of Central F, right? And then he, he, you know, he left Baker Hughes and took some time off and then he re-entered on the market and he got hired by Barrett's and he's rebuilt, rebuilt the team and you can see the effect of what Will Fobble has been able to do with this little company called Barrett's. And so um, we do track trends. Um, here's a report that we I think we're going to send something out on this just as a courtesy to the operators on the Permian Basin. But if you were to go into the Permian Basin really quick and you were to take a look at, say, Baker Hughes, not to pick on anybody, but if you look at Baker Hughes's performance by product line in the Permian Basin, if you were a Permian Basin operator like Doxy, you would say, well, I'd maybe consider them for rotary steerables, even though Jonathan would have his feedback on that, I'm sure. At least he'd definitely use them to build the curve. <laughs> they build a really good curve. May not want to use them for the lateral. But, but you can see rotary steerables, wireline logging, drill bits, packers, even rod lift. Remember how they, um, they bought Lufkin, right? And they drove Lufkin into the ditch for like six years. And they just finally got that thing out of the ditch. And it's nest now moving from this left-hand side, getting closer to the right-hand side, right? But, you know, every operator has a scatter plot. Like this is the Permian Basin. And, and we can track it by trend, 16, 17, 18, 19. We can break it up by basin. It's uh, very comprehensive. Halliburton's pretty strong in the front end. Let's see what they look like. And you can see, you know, Halliburton's problem is they're trying to chart, they have a pricing strategy that pl places them up here, but their performance isn't far enough over to the right. So what was Halliburton's response to that? They laid off a bunch of people from May to summer of 19. They laid off a bunch of people in December. They announced to Wall Street that they were cutting $300 million of SG&A out, out of their business. Because this pricing strategy, being placed up here is going to put them in a position to where they're going to have market share erosion. And they're going to ask, where does that market share erosion go to? Well, that market share erosion goes to, remember I told you there's hundreds of these smaller mid-tier oil field service companies that in aggregate outperform the big three in the Permian Basin, All right? You saw it here in the artificial lift report. There was a company called Endurance that many of you probably haven't heard of. They plotted favorably. TRC plotted favorably. Uh, Liberty. Liberty Lift plotted favorably for rod lift systems. A lot of people haven't heard of Liberty Lift. Some of them get it confused with Liberty Oil Field Services, which is a hydraulic traction company. Like I said, we have data on over 1,500 oil field service companies, and some of the names are very strikingly similar, and it's hard for us to keep track of them, much less an operator, right? 
So yeah, but tracking the trends is, is good. It, you know, when we work with oil companies, the number one challenge is they tell us, and you know, particularly they say, look, there is no way as an oil company we can evaluate a supplier if we've never used them. What would we evaluate them on? <laughs> we have no evidence of what they're gonna do. I can judge them on their price and how nice the responses they were in the tendering process as I, you know, did what we do to them to get their prices down. And, but that's it. I don't know how they're gonna perform in the field, right? When you talk to the operations side of the oil company, they'll tell you, oh, there, there's differences, and you need to make, you get what you pay for. And the supply chain organizations of, of oil companies, they tend to want to, you know, commoditize everything down, and our job is to open up the eyes. And we've had some success with supply chain organizations to open up their eyes, that you need to be careful. You know, if all you're gonna go for is lowest price and first available, well, <laughs> that may not give you the very best outcome that you're seeking. And we have, we have lots of documented examples of that in our research that I won't bore you with. But I think the most famous one that I like to talk about though is from my old out of moderate Chevron where in the deep water Gulf of Mexico we used Slumberge for 12 straight years in the deep water and then someone in supply chain said, we gotta go up for bid. Halliburton came in, dropped the price 24% lower. It's gonna charge, it was gonna save $125 million over four or five years. Chevron bit that thing. And that $25 million in annual savings was chewed up in four months of non-productive time of one well in the deep water Gulf of Mexico to the point that Chevron choked and said, we can't take this anymore. And they removed Halliburton off the deep water rigs. And they would have brought Slubberjay back onto the rig but it was such a nasty divorce that the bridge was burned and there was no way to cross back. So Baker Hughes got in there. And so when I sat down with the president of Chevron after all that happened, who used to be my division geologist, I said, what were you thinking? And I showed him all the data and he's just like, oh no, it was terrible. Lawyers got involved, everything. I mean, you know, the bridge was torched as they left town. It's gonna to take years to rebuild that relationship. But that was a classic example of an oil company making emotional decisions and not making data-driven decisions. Had they made data-driven decisions, Chevron never would have done that. And you know, this was the president of this Chevron thing. And he said, well, you gotta go help in the supply chain. So I met with the supply chain organization. I went back to him and said, well, I can only help you so much because they were not wanting to be helped. They, were, they felt stung, they were embarrassed, they were defensive, it was just bad. I said, this is gonna take a few years to simmer. Just, just let it simmer, <laughs> right? And so, I mean, those are the realities of life, right? We see it all the time. But, um, but clearly, and this is a real struggle for the oil companies is, there's a lot of independent suppliers out there that you probably haven't heard of that could probably do you a good job. Um, and so, anyway, we're, we're approaching the top of the hour. I need to be respectful of everyone's schedule. Um, 